Or I like how that lady announces it now. <laughs> Join me. Baruch ata Aronai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kidshanu b'mitzvotah v'tzivanu la'asok b'divrei Torah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Today we begin chapter five of Pirkei Avot, um, which means uh, five out of six, and uh, that's that's exciting for us. There are six chapters of Pirkei Avot, which is a recursive structure, meaning that it echoes the structure of the overall Mishnah, which is six orders of the Mishnah. Um, if you are a Seder enthusiast at Pesach and make it all the way to the very end, and you sing, who knows one, I know one, or read it in English, six are the orders of the Mishnah, five the books of the Torah, four the matriarchs, three of the patriarchs, two of the tablets of the covenant, one is our God in heaven and on earth. That's a, of course, there are 13 of those verses, um, including, by the way, number 13, which refers to a point of our discussion from last week's class, uh, 13 are the attributes of God. Um, so um, anyway, it's a reference to Maimonides' 13 articles um, that we uh, talked about last week. Anyway, that's a, that's a digression. Um, so six are the uh, chapters of the Pirkei Avot, and six are the orders of the Mishnah. Um, I have been, uh, much to my discredit, remiss in teaching and practicing with you a wonderful little custom, which is that when a new chapter of Avot is undertaken, there's a special prayer that is recited, or a special um, uh, axiom. Um, it comes from the Babylonian Talmud, tractate Sanhedrin, or Sanhedrin, uh, daf page 90a, and it quotes from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 60. So I'm going to read it in Hebrew uh, by way of setting an intention, which is really all this is. It's a way of setting an intention and reminding us that there's an ultimate or overarching spiritual purpose to studying uh, Pirkei Avot. Kol Yisrael yesh lahem chelek laolam haba. All Israel has a share in the world to come. Shne emar, as it is said, Ve'amech kulam tzadikim le'olam yirshu aretz netzer mata'ai ma'ase yadai lehit pa'er. As it is said, your people are all righteous, they shall inherit the land forever, they are a shoot of my own planting, a work of my own hands, that I may be glorified. Uh, and there's actually a lot going on in this little frontspiece or axiom that is traditionally recited before beginning a new chapter of Mishnah Avot. Um, first, something familiar, and then second, something that may not be as familiar. The familiar thing by now should be, especially having studied the last half of chapter four in, in quite some depth, all Israel has a share in the world to come. That there is a not only uh, an earthly benefit to studying Avot, but also that it is a reminder or even perhaps helps us attain the kind of merit that will allow us to enjoy our portion in Olam Haba, which instead of world to come, you know by now I prefer hereafter, um, in the next phase of our existence, our, our beyond the earthly existence. So some kind of spiritual merit accrues to the one who studies Pirkei Avot. It, it is the underlying intention behind reciting this passage from the Talmud at the beginning of starting a new chapter of Avot. The second one is a proof text, right? So don't take it on my word, says the anonymous rabbi of the Talmud, who goes by the name Stam. Stam is the anonymous third person voice of the Talmud. It simply means the simple um, or the plain voice, um, but it basically is the anonymous narrator of Talmudic passages that, as you know by now, are richly and uh, in extraordinary detail delineated, right? You, you can't get to a line of Talmud without reading the entire uh, lineage of rabbis who taught this whatever is being considered one to the next to the next to the next. However, there are times when an anonymous narrative voice kind of 
threads the whole thing uh, and makes it cohesive, and that is called the stam. So the stam uses a proof text here from the book of Isaiah. How do we know it, that is to say that um, studying uh, avot or this pursuit that we're doing together attains merit for us in the world to come? The line from Isaiah, your people are all righteous. So we start with a baseline that, you know, the Jewish people are singled out for tzedek. They shall inherit the land forever. Okay, so that is actually a, a promise by God. Remember that that is not just about the earthly domain. At the time the rabbis are writing this, they have already been exiled from the land. Therefore, they shall inherit the land forever is not a statement of national sovereignty in the olam hazeh, in the here and now. It is a statement about restorative justice in the olam haba. Right? They shall inherit the land forever. You're going to get your land back. Uh, to anyone who says that the idea of Zionism is this, uh, you know, uh, shmuel come lately on the world stage, not so. Zionism is embedded into the Jewish consciousness from, you know, from the Torah and especially in the rabbinic literature for thousands of years. Um, your people are all righteous, they shall inherit the land forever. They are a shoot of my own planting, a lovely image, this agricultural image of God's own little, uh, you know, tree or sapling that God took the care and time to plant and nourish and water, a work of my own hands that I may be glorified. I, God. So in other words, the whole point is that it's not so much for the glory of the Jewish people that a promise is made that we will be restored as, you know, shoots and saplings in our own uh, indigenous land. It is above all, especially for the glory of God. Now back to why put this at the front of Avot, and you get a lovely, again, kind of intention. The idea is that studying Avot is intended to help us earn the, stat, uh, the uh, attribute that is ascribed to us from the outset, which is that we are all righteous. Pirkei Avot is above all a text on how to live a good life, not a life that, that feels good uh, or where we prosper materially, as we have discussed, but rather a life of goodness to help us be better people. And I think that's why it, it seems that whenever a vote is taught, you know, with a 21st century audience, people really gravitate to this text. Um, I, I, I don't need to talk to you about this because I'm preaching to the converted. You get that a vote is actually a really special text because it's, um, it's so rich and uh, provocative in what it says about the meaning of a life that is good. Okay, so that's my, that's my preamble. And now we're going into chapter five. And chapter five is not like the preceding four chapters. You're going to notice it right away. It, it's going to feel different. It's going to sound different. The first thing you'll notice is that none of the statements in chapter five of Avot are attributed to a rabbi or rabbis. They're all, as it were, in the voice of the stam, which is why I wanted to introduce you to that concept up front. Um, they are simply stated as declarative statements, no attribution necessary. That's feature number one that you're going to notice. Uh, feature number two, they are framed typically around uh, numerical mnemonic devices playing off of the numbers 10, 7, and 4, and I think occasionally three, though interestingly, we have seen that, four, that three has been the governing uh, number behind most Pirkei Avot statements up until now. Now we're going to be looking at lists of 10, seven, and four, principally, for the next uh, several Mishnayot. Um, the third thing I would say about chapter five is that there's a different feel to the content. But I don't want to say much about what that is because that's my gut response to the text and I'm still working through this as, as a reader and student of the text myself. I have a feeling that you'll have some insights that will help me and your fellow students get more in touch with that feature of chapter five that it seems to 
to feel different from the other texts. And why don't we dive right in and, and see what it has to offer us. So um, I'm going to call up Avot chapter 5. Um, sorry, I lost my tab, as I often do. Uh, and somebody is entering our class, so I will let that person in one moment. So this is, uh, hang on one second. Joe Levine. Welcome, Joe. Hi, Joe. Okay. Hey, Joe. Hey, Dan Diane. Nice to see you both. Um, so chapter five. Let's, um, and Safaria, by the way, this wonderful online database of Jewish texts that just gets better every day, recently announced they're going to be preparing an original translation, the first time in, in decades, of the entire Midrash Rabbah, which is a very big deal indeed. Okay, chapter five. Be asara ma'amarot nivra ha'olam. This is not a hard statement. You've actually, even if you don't know any Hebrew, almost everyone in this class should be able to understand this in Hebrew. Asara is 10. Uh, 10 is eser sometimes, asara in the feminine conjugation. So asara ma'amarot. You may say, oh, we haven't seen that word ma'amarot, but chop off the mem at the front, chop off the plural suffix ot at the end, and you're left with amar, which is the same as omer, which is the word that we read at the beginning of every Mishnah, which says to say. Ma'ama wrote, therefore, are sayings. So it's interesting that the same word pops up, but instead of like Rabbi Yossi Omer, it just says Be'asara Ma'ama wrote. Here are 10 utterances. So we're still beginning in a way with a shout out to the power of the spoken word. In this case, however, the utterances are not rabbinic utterances, they are divine utterances. These are what God had to say. So, nivra is just the passive form of bore, as in bore pri hagafen, to create, creator of the fruit of the vine. Ha'olam, you know, is the world. So with 10 utterances, the world was created. I would describe this like I do many phrases in the Talmud, easy to translate, hard to understand because it doesn't actually unpack it. With 10 utterances, the world was created. Well, what does that mean? Which 10? I, we read in the Torah, you know, in the beginning of God's creating the heavens and the earth, when the world was without form and void and darkness hovering uh, over the face of the deep and God's presence over the surface of the waters, then God said, let there be light, and there was light. That's one utterance, <laughs> last time I checked. Now, but if you read on, of course, God says many, many times. So let's, let's do a count um, together as a class and see what we come up with. So what we're going to do is I'm going to display on the screen uh, the very first uh, chapter of Genesis. So this is, uh, let's see if we can get to 10. Okay. Breshi bara Elohim et there's that word bara to create Elohim et hashamayim et When God began to create heaven and earth, as I said, the earth being unformed and void, darkness over the surface of the deep, and a wind from God, I said God's presence, sweeping, I said hovering over the water. God said, Vayomer Elohim yehi or vayhi or. That's one. God saw the light was good. God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day. I'm not sure that's an utterance. And God called the darkness night. There was evening. There was morning a first day. God said, Vayomer Elohim, let there be an expanse in the midst of the water. So this is sky, that it may separate water from water. That's two. God made the expanse. It separated the water and it was so. God called the expanse sky. Now, day three. God said, let the water below the sky be gathered into one area, and the dry land may appear, so you have land and sea. That's the third utterance of creation. Okay. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation. That's four. Okay. Plants. The earth brought forth vegetation, seed-bearing plants of every kind, trees of every kind. There was evening, there was morning, a third day. Okay, five. God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate day from night. So stars and moon and sun, celestial uh, bright bodies, day five. God made these two great lights. 
the moon and the sun, and of course the stars, and God set them in the expanse of the sky, and God saw this was good. Evening and morning, a fourth day. Okay, number six. God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, birds that fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky, sea monsters, all the living creatures of every kind that creep. Okay, God said, God blessed them saying, I think that's seven. I didn't do this ahead of time, by the way. Let's, let's, let's assume that that's number seven. God said, be fertile and increase. Evening and morning, a fifth day. God said, now if I'm right, this is eight. Let the earth bring forth every living kind of, every kind of living creature, cattle, creeping things, and wild beasts. And it was so. God saw that it was good. God said, let us make humankind in our image. That's nine. They shall rule the fish of the sea. Ba -ba 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 -bum. God created humankind in the divine image, image of God, creating a male and female, and God blessed them, and God said, every one of these has a vayomer lahem Elohim. God said, in this case, to them, to the creatures, to the, to the people, be fertile and increase, fill the earth and master it, rule the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and all the living things that creep on the earth, and this is probably part of the same utterance, I give you every seed-bearing plant that is upon all the earth, and every tree that has seed-bearing fruit, they shall be yours for food. And to all the animals on land, to all the birds of the sky, to everything that creeps on earth in which there is the breath of life, I give all the green plants for food. So by the way, we were vegetarians according to chapter 1 of Genesis, and it was so. And God saw, not said, God saw all that had been made, found it very good. There was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. And then God rests on the Shabbat, but doesn't have to say anything. So, Pirkei Avot is right. There are exactly ten utterances, um, and I don't think it was creative math. I think there are legit ten things God said that create the world. So now we know that it's not just, um, you know, it's, it, you, it, you can verify. Trust but verify. Back to Pirkei Avot. With ten utterances, the world was created. And what does this teach? For surely it could have been created with one utterance. In other words, come on, God is God. God needed to say ten. Why couldn't God just say, Yehi hakol, let there be everything, and everything came to be. And that's not how it works. A, a momentary aside here. If you study the Bible as literature, and many of you have had the opportunity to do that with uh, Rabbi Reeser and, it, and variously at times with me, um, because I, appro I also approach the Bible, uh, I would say, in a multi-lensed uh, way. And as literature is a very important consideration in how I read Torah, I want to appreciate not just the content, but the, the art and the artistry the way in which the content is presented. If you read this passage as literature, I think you can make a strong case that the 10 utterances are actually part and parcel of the message. They are built into the literary form, but the idea of God creating sequentially is the idea, right? So that's not what Pirkei Avot is saying. That's what John Blake is saying, that the, the, the point here is to show the orderliness and sequentiality with which creation proceeds because it underscores that the world we inhabit is a world of order and design as opposed to random stuff happening all the time, which is not an unreasonable conclusion based on the human experience as we have discussed in our study of Pirkei Avot. Right, just stuff happening all the time, afflicting people, uh, willy-nilly. God created in an orderly design. What does this teach? For surely it could have been created with one utterance. Now here's what Avot concludes. This is Avot's answer to its own question. This was so in order to punish the wicked who destroy the world that was created with ten utterances and to give a good reward to the righteous who maintained the world that was created with 10 utterances. Now, the more I think about it, the more I think that my comment about orderliness and design is actually not far off the mark of what the rabbis of Avot are trying to say here. It's just that they say it a little bit differently. So let's unpack this comment here. It's, it's particularly thorny and deep. 
Why was the world created with ten utterances? If God could have created the world with just one saying, let, let everything come into being, why ten? This was in order to punish the wicked who destroy the world that was created with ten utterances, that's very weird, and to give a good reward to the righteous who maintain the world that was created with ten utterances. Not maintain that the world was, was created with ten utterances, but we're talking about people whose actions literally destroy the world and people whose actions uphold the world. And it's important that we look at the Hebrew here. The Hebrew for destroy is this word here, mi'abedin, which means to cause to perish or to be lost or to destroy. Um, and this word here is what the tzadikim do. So the rishayim, who are the wicked, they mi'abedin et ha'olam, they destroy the world. And these folks here, the tzadikim, the, the, the tzadiks, the, the righteous ones, mikayamin et ha'olam, they literally keep the world going. They uphold the world. So what is, what is really being communicated here? The, the, they're using a kind of mnemonic uh, as the exegetical device here. In other words, the mnemonic, the use of the ten utterances, is being brought to explain the text or explain creation um, from a content perspective. Right? So again, the rabbis ask, why did God design or create the world in ten utterances? The answer is to punish the wicked and reward the righteous. Let, let, I mean, that is not intuitively obvious. I think I, I'm, I have a few thoughts kind of bubbling up for myself, and I'd like to hear yours. Steve. So in the first instance, I, with the use of, the, of 10, I'm thinking that there is a connection with the Ten Commandments and that by, by saying that creation is in 10 steps, not not necessarily said, and that that uh, that destroying can be little bits of destroying, and and somehow or other by by following the commandments, you are maintaining the creation. Lovely. So, ten is a number that is known to us in Jewish tradition, most famously from Aseret Hadibrot, the Ten Commandments, which are a kind of metonym. Um, metonym is when uh, one thing stands in for something else. Um, so the Ten Commandments are a stand-in for the whole of the law, the whole of Torah, right? The image of the tablets of the law conveys the force of the entire Torah. Um, we do this all the time. The White House said, to, said today, well, the White House didn't say anything. The White House is just a metonym for the government or the administration. The Crown said, the crown didn't do anything. The crown sat on a shelf close enough to the queen's head so that she can put it on whenever she feels like looking at herself in the mirror with a crown on. The crown simply means the royal family or the queen. So the metonym here is that the Ten Commandments represent the law. And law, by the way, is what the Jewish uh, imagination provides as the antidote to the chaos of the world. Right, so in some ways, the Ten uh, Commandments of the Law are the uh, provision of order and design that mirrors the creation according to the rabbis here. And I'm, I'm loosely playing with your concepts here, Steve, but I think they are at least consistent, if not identical. You're, um, you're absolutely exact. That's the concept. Yeah, right. I agree with this totally. Great. Thank you. Trish. I'm trying to connect somehow the step-by-step -step process of the creation with man at the pinnacle, with being given the responsibility then to maintain. So it's not just that everything was created at one time. It was, it's very, it's a real buildup to that moment. And without that step-by-step -step process, we might not feel that responsibility. So it's particularly wicked to destroy anything that was created pretty much for us. And of Beautiful. course, for God's greater glory, but for us to maintain. 
Beautiful. So I'm going to read actually a commentary that I think, uh, Trish, your comment uh, underscores um, and, and reinforces. Um, this is from the Corin uh, Pirkei Avot, which is kind of my go-to. I have probably 10 or more um, printed copies of Pirkei Avot in my office and at home. Uh, this is the one with the translation of the Hebrew by Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs of Blessed Memory, who uh, died a couple of years ago, too young with the commentary by Rabbi Mark Angel. And I really recommend it. The only thing I, I, I don't love about it is that the way in which the footnotes are written, it's a little bit tricky um, because the, the book opens from right to left, the way Hebrew books should, but the footnotes go left to right. So the corresponding footnote for something on the right-hand page is actually at the bottom of the left-hand page on any two-page spread. It's taken me years to get this. Okay, um, so I'll just read a little bit about 10 acts of speech in light of what Trisha shared with us. The lesson here is that the world is extremely precious. God went to great lengths and extra effort, so to speak, to put the universe in place. Thus, one who abuses the creation is highly culpable, just as one who sustains creation is highly meritorious. Destroying and sustaining creation may be understood in two ways. It can refer to the physical treatment of the natural world, that is, the proper care for the Earth's resources, the environment, and animal life. So all of that, I think, reinforces Trish's point, that the laying out of creation stepwise, stage by stage, to say, look at the glory of this, look at the glory of that, appreciate now in my final utterance what it means to be given mastery or dominion, or the word I prefer, which is stewardship over the world that has just been created. Appreciate with great sensitivity each and every aspect of the glory of creation. So that's the physical responsibility that the tzaddikim uphold in their righteous conduct. As well as he goes on here, so I think elaborating from where Trish left off, these terms also may refer to spiritual concerns. The physical world, according to our sages, is interrelated with the spiritual world. The physical world can only continue to exist if the spiritual world is in order. Thus, the righteous, through their righteous deeds, add to the scale of merit so that God will continue to maintain the world. The wicked, though, add to the scale of demerit. Their immoral deeds if not counterbalanced by the deeds of the righteous, will lead to God's destruction of the world. So I, I think that both of these are true, right? If we look back now at Avot chapter 5, Mishnah 1, this was so in order to punish the wicked who destroy the world that was created with ten utterances and to give a good reward to the righteous who maintain the world that was created with ten utterances. And so the orderliness and design of the world in the physical domain mirrors the, the world of ethical consideration, of spiritual consideration, and of physical stewardship or maintenance of the beauty and design of creation. And perhaps, excuse me, the biggest lesson that emerges out of all of this, and it's really quite extraordinary, is how much God demands and requires and needs human partnership in sustaining the creation, which is a very bold and extraordinarily important Jewish statement of theology. It's what do Jews believe about God? I would put, the, if you were teaching a class on what do Jews believe about God, I would not miss the opportunity to include Pirkei Avot chapter 5, Mishnah 1, because the very idea of God needing humankind as God's partners, not in creating the world, but in maintaining the world, both on the physical level and on the spiritual and ethical levels, I would say is a central point of Jewish theology that is maintained throughout much, if not all, of Jewish literature from this point forward. Um, that, And in fact, you could even say that the Torah makes its own uh, convincing argument in that direction, that God created humankind not as a vanity project, but in order to do what God, either by choice or necessity, would not or could not, which is maintain the creation. 
Now, if you get into deep Kabbalism, Jewish mysticism of the 13th century on to really the present day, this idea is amplified and I would say extensively elaborated in the notion not only does God need human beings to maintain the creation, but God needs humankind to fix what is broken in creation. And that's a theme that I explored in my Yom Kippur remarks last fall. Other comments or thoughts on Pirkei Avot chapter 5, Mishnah 1. It's a, it's a real biggie. What well, not it also finished creation that, uh, that people are needed, not just fix? Yes, um, one could say to complete, right? Yes, so th there are lots of different words that might describe the, what the human being is charged with, or what the Jew in particular is charged with doing vis-a-vis -vis the original creation. In this text, the word is mikayem or mikayamin which means to uphold. From kayim, which means to, to found, to stand, to lift up, to be, st to be standing. Um, so le um, to uphold the creation, which is a maintenance function. However, elsewhere in the literature, in the mystical literature, in Kabbalism, the word is le to fix, to repair, to restore, to rebalance. And elsewhere, though I couldn't give you chapter and verse for the source, you can find le hashlim, which means to make whole, from shalom or shalem to complete. That complete that. So this is also a bold later Jewish theological notion that the world in its entirety was not complete. That human beings are completing it with God, and not just any human beings. That's why there is a special role for the righteous. And there is an acknowledgement that the righteous, it's not going to be uh, uh, an easy go, right? It's going to be an uphill climb because all the while that the righteous are working to maintain the world, the wicked are working to destroy it, to undo it. And so if there is a great battle between good and evil, it's not waged in the cosmic sphere. It's waged here among the righteous and the wicked of the earth. So there's also a very important statement of Jewish theology that God's creation provides for those who are righteous and who will uphold the creation, maintain the creation, or maybe even fix, make whole, advance the creation, and those whose project, as it were, on earth seems to be to undermine, to destroy, to detract. Um, we have a few comments. Let's go Michelle first, then Judy. So I'm thinking, Excuse me. I'm thinking about so the Ten Commandments are debrot, which are words or utterances, right? So that's the same root as asarot midaber or midabrot, right? Um, yeah. So in the Torah itself, um, the word is actually it's it's vocalized a little bit unusually. It's debrot from daber. Um, so it's. Uh, Eser hadibrot or asorah hadibrot, the, the ten utterances, it's which so is, I'm glad you're pointing this out. It's not the same as ma'amarot, which are the ten utterances, the term that's used for utterances here in avot, but it's the same idea. It's not ten laws. It's actually not ten commandments. There is no place in the Torah that says these are the ten commandments. We have a word for commandments. It's mitvot. We don't have that. We have Asara Dibrot, the 10 things God says. And we're back now to Steve with the way in which those utterances counterbalance or are a kind of overlay or mirror image of the 10 utterances of creation. But go on, Michelle, you're, you're, right. I think so, you're leading us in the right direction. Well, I'm not sure where I'm going. I'm simply trying, I'm trying to sort of open a thought on the, both the, maybe three things one is with words the second is spokenness of it utterances and the third thought is in order to do this you need actions and i'm not sure what the interrelationship is but it seems to me that there's something <laughs> yeah um we should ask our zoroastrian friends um the creed of the zoroastrian faith 
is very simple, though it's in the ancient language uh, from Persia called Avastan. Um, and it translates to good thoughts, good words, good deeds. Um, my friend Darius Lakdawala, who is a practicing Zoroastrian, taught me that. But you can actually hear it in, of all places, a fairly lousy Hollywood uh, biopic, uh, the movie about Freddie Mercury that came out three or four years ago, with, uh, which won the Best Actor Oscar for Rami Malek, who played the title, who played Freddie Mercury of Queen. Um, Freddie Mercury was a Zoroastrian, and he grew up in a uh, Zoroastrian home. In fact, he's disparaged um, with the ethnic slur in uh, the UK, Paki, like from Pakistan, which he's not. Um, it's Persian ancestry. Anyway, there's a scene in the movie, though, which I immediately kind of did like a little jump of joy when I recognized what was happening. He's uh, kind of, you know, being cranky and whatnot, and his father puts him in his place by reminding him, you know, he says, Freddie, good thoughts, good words, good deeds. Um, and I said, aha, they didn't even explain it in the movie, but I happen to know that that's the creed of the Zoroastrian faith. So it's not just warm parental advice. And I think that there's a nice uh, reinforcement of the uh, idea that thought leads to word, leads to deed. And of course, we could spill mountains of ink writing about, as the rabbis did, about the power of the spoken word as a creative force. Um, wonderful. Judy, then Joe. Uh, just, yes, um, just the image of the brokenness of the world. Isn't that a Kabbalistic that the world is in shards and that is up to us to, to bring it all together? Um, and that is that the, the tikkun olam? Um, right, that is the original, I shouldn't say the original. So Kabbalism, or Kabbalah, is, um, originates, as it were, though nothing comes out of whole cloth in any world faith, and Judaism most especially, um, out of a 13th century Spanish work known as Zohar, which means radiance or splendor, out of Zohar, which itself, by the way, um, masquerades, proposes that it is the lost testimony of Rabbi Shimon bar Yochai, who with his son hid out in a cave for a year and more, or seven years, um, during the Bar Kokhba revolt. It's totally bogus, but that's the story that Zohar itself attaches to its origins. Um, but it's actually a 13th century Spanish work which lays the foundations of Jewish Kabbalistic thinking. Three centuries later, in the 1600s, a disciple of Zohar, a student of Zohar, who legend has it sequestered himself in a cottage by the Nile River in isolation and studied Zohar for, again, I think it's something like seven years. <laughs> it's always seven years. Um, named Isaac Luria, who was raised by a wealthy uncle uh, who was a merchant in Cairo. So Isaac Luria, a Jew whose family had fled uh, Spain in the, in, after the following the Inquisition, the expulsion of Jews from Spain at the end of the 15th century, Isaac Luria, whose father died young, was taken in by his uncle, lived in Cairo, studied Zohar, and then returned to Eretz Yisrael and founded a community of scholars and disciples whom he taught orally. Um, he didn't really write anything that we have, but his disciples write in his name. So they claim that Luria taught them everything they now know. Luria came up with a basically a new understanding of creation and the divine role in the world, which said that in the beginning, there was God, and there was nothing that was not God. And in order to make room for creation, God contracted the divine being in an act that is called tzimtzum, a word that means to self-contract. It's not just to, you know, to, it's not, um, it's, it's an uh, intransitive verb. It's not transitive. It's not acted upon something else. God actually self-contracted. Simtum means to pull oneself into oneself, to make one small. Humility in the Jewish tradition is often associated with the quality of Simtum, the ability to make oneself smaller in, in order to make room for something or someone else. God performed an act of Simtum, and the contraction was what allowed God to, as it were, give birth to the world. And I'm using these 
um, birth images intentionally because um, a, a colleague or a soon-to-be colleague of mine named Anna Calamaro, who is a rabbinical student at Hebrew Union College in Los Angeles, who has who's also a doula. So she is a woman who assists other women in uh, child, uh, in pregnancy and childbirth. Um, so soon-to-be Rabbi Calamaro points out that the word contraction is meaningful because contractions are what prepare a woman for the birth process, right? They, the act of contracting allows the child to be born. Through, however, the act of creation, the divine light that flowed into the now created space where God had contracted, self-contracted the divine being, God had created these vessels to contain the divine light and the vessels were shattered in the violence of the creative process. And because of the shattered vessels, darkness, evil, misfortune, brokenness permeated the world. So it, the whole thing is a gorgeous and complicated, elaborate metaphor for why we have evil, why we have suffering, and why we can still affirm God as the creator of all. And God specifically charges the human being, or the Jew even more specifically, with the restoration of the world, which is uh, carried out through the gathering up of the sparks of divine creation and restoring them to wholeness. That act of cosmic restoration is known as tikkun ha'olam, which actually is a much older word in the Talmud, but in the Talmud, tikkun ha'olam simply means the social order, for the sake of the social order. It's fascinating, like it has a legal application. And so in the earlier Talmudic literature, remember Kabbalism or Lurianic Kabbalah, the Kabbalah of Isaac Luria is 16th century stuff. So we're going back a thousand years earlier. You got to really appreciate what a thousand years means. A thousand years ago, we had Chaucer. Not even. Chaucer was 1200s. So a thousand years, our literature was like somewhere between Beowulf and Chaucer in English. So imagine how much Jewish literature is created and, ex and promulgated over a thousand years. Anyway, in the Talmud, there's a case, for instance, of what happens if a member of the Jewish community is kidnapped by an enemy and the enemy demands a ransom. And the Talmud says that on the one hand, it is a Jewish imperative to ransom captives. On the other hand, the passage goes on to say that if you pay too much, you will incentivize bandits to carry out more acts of kidnapping. And so they say the consideration for Pidyon HaShivuyim, the mitzvah, the commandment to redeem captives, must be counterbalanced by, and here's the phrase, tikkun ha'olam, the social order. Because if you over-demonstrate your commitment to ransoming captives, you could upend the social order by creating more chaos, more kidnappings. Following? So it's fascinating that this term that means nothing more than the sake of the social order, tikkun ha'olam, is completely twisted and redeployed by Luria and his followers as a cosmic notion that actually what God wants for us is not the preservation of social mores and standards and you know a quality of living or anything that goes with the old sense of tikkun ha'olam, but rather now tikkun ha'olam means we are physically and spiritually engaged in a repair of the cosmos, which broke when God made it. As a very long answer to a great question, Judy, but does it answer where you were leading us? Thank you. Okay. Fascinating. Great. Joe Levine. Oh, kindly unmute. Yes, please. I was wondering about two points in our discussion. One alluding to something that Steve said before which led to your answering about going back to the uh, to Bereshus, to creation. Uh, in the first sentence, when it talked about 10 utterances of God, I immediately thought, 10, I immediately thought what, what Steve thought, that it was had something to do with the 10 commandments. Right. And then when you started mentioning, you know, we started talking about 
God said, God said, I thought I counted 11. I may not be wrong. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, there are 11 God said. said. And um, right. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to say the rabbis probably viewed the last utterance as a long form mini sermon because God not only says, fill the earth, you know, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Then it says God said, but there's no interruption in between. God said X. And so I think the rabbis are saying, for the sake of clarity, the text actually says God said 11 times, but the last utterance is just one. Uh, about language, I'm very interested. I, I love to, you know, listen to language and try to decipher things. Whoever wrote the Bereshit, you know, somebody had to write it down for us to be able to read it. When they say, or when it says, God said, I'm trying to think, who did he say it to? Right. Well, God is like the stum of the Talmud. It's the anonymous narrator of existence. Okay. Am I, and and I guess... clearly, I mean, in the Kabbalistic frame, God actually doesn't create through speech. God creates through just divine contraction. And um, God's presence in the world comes by way of what is, uh, I'm, I'm going to, uh, what is called, yes, here's the word, because I've been studying this literature in my Institute for Jewish Spirituality uh, uh, leadership program. The word is Shefa. Um, Shefa is a Hebrew word that means effluence, which is just a fancy Latinate way of saying that which flows. Um, right, effluence. So God in the Kabbalah does not speak, God flows into the world. And actually God flows into God's self. It's, it's a very complex notion, but if you want to meditate on it, sit one day in the sanctuary of Westchester Reformed Temple, where you have a good view of the Aron HaKodesh, the Holy Ark at the front of the room, and meditate on the verse that is inscribed on our Ark. To my knowledge, this is the only synagogue in the world that chose this unusual verse, Genesis chapter 2, verse 10, which says, Nahar yotzei me'eden lehashkot et agan. A river flows from Eden to water the garden. That is a weird old verse to put in the middle of an Ark. Um, and the reason it is used is because in the Zohar, that verse is cited more than any other single biblical verse to explain how God enters the world. Nahar is the effluence or the flow, the river. Yotzei Me'eden flows out of Eden. Eden is seen as the imperceptible, unknowable, ineffable divine source known as the Ein Sof which literally means that which has no end, the God which is both everything and nothing, but resides in a, in a state where we can only perceive by inference. It's kind of like a black hole. How do you know that a black hole exists? Because you can't see it. All you know is that it has an effect on everything around it. It has a gravitational pull, right? So God is like that black hole, but God's effluence or light or energy or flow comes from the source, the, the invisible, ineffable Eden, <clears throat> in order to water the garden. And the garden in the Zoharic metaphor refers to the world that we live in, the terrestrial realm, this world, the world as I've taken to calling it of dry cleaning and haircuts, right? The, 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 the physical world. And Torah becomes the vehicle by which we participate in directing the flow. And that's why it's a great inscription on an ark. And by the way, that's why it's on the boundary between the world inside the sanctuary, which is the world of spiritual attainment and aspiration, and what's right behind a wall of glass, which is a garden, more importantly, it's the world outside. That's why there's no stained glass in the new sanctuary of Westchester Reformed Temple. By the way, just a, by show of hands, how many of you knew about this about the design of our, of our sanctuary? Okay, Joe, yeah, right. 
So I'm, I'm very, if you ever want, I should do like a teach on it. Like if, now that the sanctuary is like 12 or 13 years old, we should do a night or a day where we come into the sanctuary and I show you the way in which the Zohar and the mystical doctrine of creation and tikkun haolam are the design elements that went into visualizing mm -hmm. our praying space. It's, it's very intentional. And by the way, it's very Rick Jacobs. Um, and, and it was one of those things where I really, I learned a lot by just watching him participate in the conversations with the architects and turning a kind of very lofty, a bit ambiguous vision into something, you know, made of wood and glass and stone. It's very cool. Okay. Um, one more comment from Steve and then we'll, we'll proceed. I, th this Mishnah is fascinating to me because I, we, we touched on it a little bit, the difference between the concept of maintain versus uh, versus the phrases used later of repairing or uh, or completing. Because I, I, I think about this Mishnah in the context of rabbis that have experienced or are dealing with the destruction of the temple. And it feels like maintaining is not rebuilding, but somehow just surviving in a way. And I just thought Lovely, you Steve. might reflect on that. Lovely, Steve. I really, really like that. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to put into the chat window um, a sermon that I delivered, I think it was last Labor Day, on um, the Vedic doctrine of creation, maintenance, and destruction. The Vedas are ancient uh, texts from the uh, Indian subcontinent that become the cornerstone of Hindu thought and influence Buddhist thought as well. So Eastern spirituality is deeply indebted to the Vedas, though they do not themselves regard themselves as part of a specific religious tradition. And therefore, I think the Vedas are wonderful um, to bring into conversation with any spiritual tradition, including our own. So I gave this sermon from notes um, on what day is it? I'm looking at it here. November. Well, I gave it right before the high holidays, but then I, I went back to my notes and transcribed it in sermon form. So many of you probably have never read this, um, but I'm, I'm, it, was, it was something that I was pretty happy with how it came out. So I'm going to put it in the chat window. You don't have to go there now, but if you want to copy the link, um, it, it was part of the Bob Dylan series of sermons. And whether you loved them or hated them, uh, the last one is this coming Friday, tomorrow night. Um, for Chai Society Shabbat, the last of my year-long project of the Torah of Bob is officially coming to an end. I can't, I can't promise that I won't be quoting him again, um, but I, I, wrote, I wrote some comments that I think are very consistent, Steve, with where uh, your, your question slash comment leads us. Okay. Let's proceed. Um, that just means I have to do a little tab switch. Bear with me. All right, I don't know what I'm going to do when I have to start using paper handouts again. Here we are. Mishnah uh, Avot, Chapter 5, Mishnah 2. Um, asara, okay, now you know what Asara means. It means 10. So we're sticking with 10. And by the way, uh, teaching number 3 is also a 10. So Asara Dorot. Dorot, you know. It's the social service agency that helps elderly shut in Jewish members of the Jewish community. Dorot means generations. Lidor vador hallelujah. From generation to generation. Dor singular, dorot plural. Asara dorot me adam ve ad noach. There were 10 generations from Adam to Noah. Now again, they're going to start with a declaration of something that you were not going to go into the Bible and actually count generations, by the way. You can do it. It requires a little bit of fuzzy math, but it is a uh, rabbinic, a shared rabbinic understanding that there were 10 generations from Adam to Noah. And by the way, well, we'll read on. I'll, I'll show you the way this mnemonic works. It's, it's a recursive mnemonic, so it's multiple 10 generations. Lehodia kama erech apayim lefanavt. In order to make known what long suffering is his, that's a lousy translation. I would simply say, in order to make known how very patient God is. Erech apayim is great. 
It literally means God's nose is long. The biblical, I may have said this before, the, when we were talking about anthropomorphism of the deity in Judaism, that God is portrayed as having eyes, ears, a mouth, a face, a back, legs, feet, arms, hands, a torso even, um, and a nose. And the way God's nose pops up in the, in the Torah is in the description or the biblical way of expressing God got angry. It says, Vayichar af Adonai. Literally, the nose of God began to glow. Vayichar, like Rudolph. God's nose turned red. So when God gets angry, his nose glows. So Erech Apaim literally means having a long nose, but we're not talking about Pinocchio. Erech Apaim means it takes God a long time before the nose starts to glow. In other words, God is actually difficult to anger. Ten generations from Adam to Noah, in order to demonstrate how very patient, how slow to anger is God. Can somebody explain this? This one I think is fairly straightforward, by the way. All right, well, what did God do in the time of Noah? Uh, it, it took 10 generations for the world to be end up being destroyed, sorry, order. Right, exactly. It took God 10 generations to decide, I've had it with you people, right? So that's why, in other words, the Torah, by giving us and by delineating the genealogies that take us from Adam to Noah, the generation of Adam and Eve, all the way to Noah and Mrs. Noah and their kids, we know what happens in Noah. God says, I'm fed up. Right? I've had it with you people. Um, or in the language of uh, George Costanza's dad in the famous episode of Seinfeld about Festivus, the airing of grievances. I've got a lot of problems with you people. Played by the great um, uh, oh, uh, Jerry Stiller, may his memory be for a blessing. Um, Jerry Stiller's character, you know, loses his patience at the, you know, the drop of a hat. God, in contrast, it takes 10 generations to say, I've got a lot of problems with you people. I'm destroying the world and starting over. Okay, good. So in other words, the point of delineating 10 generations is to demonstrate something about God's nature, God's long-suffering nature. So I kept the answer from you because I wanted you to figure out on your own. For all those generations kept on provoking God until God brought upon them the waters of the flood. Okay. In other words, it's not just like Noah was the only bad generation. It's like 10 generations, people were really getting on God's nerves. But God was like, I'm going to just let people be people. And then finally by Noah, it's like, this is clearly not working. Okay. Um, there were then 10 generations from Noah to Abraham, from Noah to Abraham, in order to make known what long suffering is his. Terrible translation. Nobody talks that way. Same point, though. Another 10 generations from Noah to Abraham demonstrate God's patience, how hard it is to get God to be upset. For all those generations kept on provoking God until Abraham came and received the reward of all of them. In other words, it's not like things were peachy keen after the flood. People actually went back to being a real pain in God's neck, so to speak. Yes, God has a neck as well, I guess. Um, so. And I'll take Joe's question in a moment. So the idea here is that why so long between Adam, the first family, and Avraham, who represents the first covenant with the divine, the start of the Jewish story? If the Torah is anyone's story, it must be Abraham's story, right? All of the stuff pre-Abraham is preamble. It's prelude. It is not the story itself. It's the backdrop. It's the introduction. It's the Greek chorus at the beginning of a Shakespeare play, or a Greek play. <laughs> Shakespeare will deploy this device, though, at the beginning of his plays, though, right? He will start, I don't know, there's always like a little thing at the beginning where somebody says, I'm going to set the stage for what's been going on so far so that you know, so you understand the context for the action that is to follow. Abraham is where the action starts. The story of the Torah is covenantal relationship between the Jewish people and God. 
but there's a lot of lead up. There's 12 chapters, or there's 11 chapters of Torah before Abraham even makes mention. So, okay, um, Audrey Stoyer, then Joe. Oh, kindly unmute. Sorry, um, I, I just was wondering, God waited 10 generations for the flood, but in between there was Sodom and Gomorrah, there was uh, the Tower of Babel. I mean, it wasn't that God didn't try to punish in between. So let me get the chronology correct. You were half right. Okay. <laughs> Tower of Babel is Genesis chapter 11. That's one chapter before Abraham. And that's part of what the text is referring to. Oh. So Tower of Babel is in the same portion as Noah. Noah is a Torah portion that has two major catastrophes. The flood, <laughs> beginning in chapter 6. That story goes all the way through chapter 9. And then 9 through 11 is the Tower of Babel. Mm. The end of chapter 11, the people are dispersed. They speak different languages. God has once again foiled their designs. But in critical contradistinction to the flood story at the beginning of the portion, God does not destroy the world. God is pissed off. And God says, "Ugh, my people are hopeless and in a sense irredeemable. But this time, the best I can do is to put in some mechanisms so that they don't try to overthrow me again. Which is I like, clearly part of what is so vexing to God about the tower. It's not so much that they were collaborating on a project of human ingenuity and engineering. That should be lauded, right? right. No. What God is really worried about is they are going to try and dethrone me. This, this ziggurat, this tower that they're building, which resembled the ancient ziggurats of the Near East, with which the authors were surely in some way or shape or form familiar, mm -hmm. said, no, 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 no. This is not what I want from my people. Um, and so I'm going to make it harder for them to collaborate. I'm going to scatter their, them geographically and linguistically. I'm going to scramble their speech. Now, some of this is a Rudyard Kipling, how the leopard got its spots kind of story. It's obviously looking at the world and in a mythic or folkloric frame, trying to account for, huh, why do we have so many different languages? You would think that God's design would want us to collaborate, and then they tell this cautionary tale. That's a, Sodom and Gomorrah is actually Genesis chapters 19 and 20. So it's part of the Abraham narrative. However, it affects Abraham's uh, nephew, Lot, who is the very definition of a shlamazel. Yeah. Or a shlamil, depending on, you know, um, a shlamazel, though, a person whose only luck is bad luck, that's Lot. Just finds himself in the wrong place at the wrong time, time oh. and time again. Abraham advocates, in the case of Sodom and Gomorrah, on oh. behalf of the innocent denizens of those twin cities, should God find even ten righteous souls, I'm obviously condensing, will you spare the city for the sake of the ten? And God finally relents and says, okay, Abraham, yes. So there you have... Maybe the first great example, and maybe still in the Torah, in the scripture, the greatest example of what Pirkei Avot chapter 5, Mishnah 1, is trying to say. That human moral agency, the agency of the tzaddikim, is what upholds the world. Right? God may have created, but human beings are necessary to uphold the order, at least in the ethical and spiritual domain. Um, but yeah, but the, your point base, your overall point is still correct that God was still responding to people being wayward before Abraham comes on the scene. But once Abraham comes on the scene, it's very important to note what God asks of Abraham. Here I'm not going to get the exact uh, quote, but I'll look it up or somebody else can, and I'm going to come close. When God says to Abraham, you shall you know, be the father of a multitude of nations and a uh, king shall issue from your loins, and you shall be as numerous as the stars in heaven and the sands on the seashore. A, a promise in covenantal form that is issued to Abraham by God many times in Genesis. There's one line in particular that says, I do this in order to charge you to pursue tzedek umishpat, justice and righteousness, and to promote these qualities in the world. In other words, when Abraham responds at Sodom and Gomorrah, it is not just because Abraham has a kind of natural human impulse. Abraham already has internalized that he's on a mission from God. And that mission is to promote tzedek, righteousness, the same root as tzadikim, right. 
and mishpat, which means justice. And so Abraham, as the kind of living embodiment of those divine qualities of righteousness and justice, he recognizes, wait a minute, God, you told me. You told me, don't, don't act like you're not responsible for this. You told me this was my work. And so I think that, again, we have a demonstration in the Abraham narrative of the way in which the premise of Pirkei Avot chapter 5, verse, section 1, gets carried out. The human being or the human community, and specifically the Jew, right. is charged with being an instrument of order and design, justice, fairness, tzedek, and even chesed, which is compassion, though not mentioned here, that was part of design, God's design for the world, but that only we can carry out to its fullest. Lovely, though. Thank you. Joe Levine. Thank you. <laughs> I noticed it was 10 generations between creation and Noah. And then, interestingly, it was 10 generations between Noah and Avram. That brings me back to my first point about what those 10 utterances were. And when I saw the word world, I didn't think of creation. I thought of the fact that it's a new world. It's a beginning again. And therefore, uh, I, agree, I, I sort of agreed with Steve that it was the giving of the Ten Commandments that would create a new world for the Jews. Beautiful, Joe. Beautiful. This is a good time for me to pause before we continue our text and go into our last uh, reading for the morning to ask you something that I, I kind of teed up at the beginning of our study today, which is, I'm going to just kind of frame, and again, I didn't have an answer to this. It was, I was talking about my gut feeling as I was preparing today's lesson and reading this literature. Sometimes I've, I've learned to trust my gut more as a rabbi. I prepare fewer notes, but I, I kind of just sit with an intention for the text to kind of just reveal itself to me. I know that sounds a little woo-woo, but bear with me. When you've been studying these texts for a long time, you kind of trust that they'll eventually open themselves to you, kind of like a flower in spring. Like, oh, now I see the petals. Now I see the different layers inside. But I began by saying, doesn't this feel different from all the other Avot stuff we've been reading so far? I mean, yes, it's it's how to live a good life, but just the way in which the instruction is conveyed. Obviously, there's the fact that it's not Rabbi such and so said. It's not a maxim. And it's, it's a mnemonic, but it's not a threefold mnemonic. So, the, so from a literary form and structure standpoint, obviously it's different. But just in terms of like it, the, I guess I would say the lens or the scope. Much of Pirkei Avot is very zoomed in. Right? We're going to talk about one specific way of being in the world, or one specific character trait, or one specific attribute, or maybe three, that somehow exist in conversation with each other, that we can put in conversation with each other. There's an almost zoomed out, like, epic scope to this. We're actually going to talk about God's design for the universe and where humanity, and specifically the Jew, fits into it. This is not, for instance, rabbis teaching young rabbis how to be rabbis. That's definitely, so there's just like, even if you're just reading it as a casual reader, I get the sense that, huh, this literature feels different, sounds different, and makes me wonder if Yehuda Hanasi, the rabbi who redacted and compiled the Mishnah in the first half of the second century, third century, my, my bad, Usually, scholars say Mishnah was completed around the year 230, 240 of the Common Era. When Yudha Nasi was doing that work, I wonder if he had access to like a kind of database, obviously, a, a, a room full of parchment, scrolls, that, that was a database, like a Geniza maybe, or a, a place where a bunch of these aphorisms had already been written down, and he was merely the editor, compiler, redactor. I don't know much about, nobody knows much about how the exact process of text redaction worked at this stage in the development of the Jewish literary tradition, but it makes me wonder if this was like a separate database. The stuff that made it into chapter five, it's like, okay, we're going to lay out chapters one through four because they give us a certain orientation toward what this part of the Talmud Pirkei Avot is all about. And now we're going to switch gears 
and give us chapter 5, which is a very different lens on what it means to be a good person. Does anyone else have any reactions? So that's sort of where my gut went over the last, you know, hour and 15 minutes. Trish. Well, I think frequently when you have a huge subject to confront, to even just to think about, you very often try to organize it and try to make lists and try to tie it down somehow so that you can talk about it, first of all, and that maybe people can remember something about what you're saying too. So it's kind of like it's such, such big ideas, not the minutia of some of the other sections that we've read, such huge ideas that, you know, okay, we're gonna make tens out of everything. It's an important number, let's use it. Let's make everything a 10 and that way people are gonna remember and they're gonna tie it all to this really important concept of God creating the world and 10 utterances. Um, Beautiful. I mean, we're only on the first couple sections so, uh, so far and I know there's more than, it's not just 10 that comes into play, but so far it's like, all right, enough with the 10, <laughs> I get it. Yeah, yeah. I, I, wish we could, I wish we could say that, but actually there are gonna be six full Mishnayot at the outset of chapter five that frame around the number 10. Uh, Steve Maskett. So I love what Trish said. It because of what I was what I was thinking about with the use of, of the of, of ten and the other numbers that you made reference to being in this chapter is that it was sort of like going back to the oral tradition, allowing things to be remembered for those who couldn't read. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, um, wonderful. Okay, let's let's look at one more today. Oh, Judy, did you want to chime in? Very quickly and simply, we're thinking of the grandest, grandest ideas of the universe and God in, in, in its grandeur. But then I was thinking, are they 10 because we have 10 fingers and 10 toes? I and think down to the minutiae, so it's just all of a sudden it was like, boom. Well, there are times when I compliment somebody by saying, and now you're thinking like a rabbi. I can't pay that compliment here because that thought at least in my awareness, doesn't arise in the rabbinic imagination. However, I'll pay you, uh, well, you have to decide whether this is a compliment, an insult, or neutral. Judy, now you're thinking like this rabbi does, right? This is, so I'm, that's the way an anthropologist would read the text, um, which I think is brilliant. Um, I think absolutely. Why do human we beings stop there? <laughs> right, no, why do we have a metric system? There's nothing inherently meritorious about 10. However, it seems that human beings are particularly good at remembering things in tens. Well, there's an obvious reason why. And it's similarly, by the way, there's a reason why the Torah talks about the seven days of creation. And the answer, yeah, Joe Levine got it. The, the answer is that people had seven day weeks. It's not the other way around, in other words. What most people conclude is, oh, we have a seven day week because God created the world in seven days. The real answer, I believe, this is anthropological reasoning, is that human beings and Jews wrote a literature that enshrines the notion of seven as part of the divine design for the world because we were familiar with seven day weeks. And what's interesting is that this wasn't just a Jewish notion. Most human civilizations long predating the Israelite civilization had seven day weeks. Why exactly? No one knows. It is not as is sometimes reasoned poorly, by the way, having anything to do with lunar cycles. The moon uh, goes through a complete cycle in I think 29 and three quarters days. Um, that is not divisible by seven. You could just as easily have three 10 day weeks in a month. And it would be, and you'd still have to make adjustments. Lunar calendars are notoriously uh, tricky to work with, right? Ramadan, which just completed, I think, last week, is now in early spring. Next year, it will be in late winter, early spring. The following year, it will be in winter, and it will migrate in reverse chronology throughout the calendar because Ramadan and the Muslim calendar is strictly lunar. Jewish holidays 
are lunar with a solar adjustment, right? So we have mechanisms built into the Jewish calendar called leap years, or shanami uberet, which you'll like this. The word for leap year in Hebrew means a pregnant year. So a year where we swell by one full month. So in a pregnant year, which this year is, 5782 is a pregnant year, um, we had two uh, Adars. We had Adar 1 and Adar 2, Adar Aleph, Adar Bet. Um, that's why the fall holidays were very early, right? You remember Rosh Hashanah was Labor Day. But the spring holidays are very late. Have you noticed? Pesach was, you know, mid-April. It was April 5th, uh, 9th, 10th, all the way till almost tax day. And Shavuot this year is, um, is June 5th, pretty late. And the high holidays next fall, which are, you know, part of the same pregnant calendar cycle, are fairly late. Rosh Hashanah begins on the 25th of September, and Yom Kippur is on the 5th of October. I know that because Kelly and I have birthdays in that, in that time of year. My birthday is September 20th, so I miss the holidays this year. But Kelly, her birthday is October 5th, which is smack dab on Yom Kippur. Happy Yom Kippur, sweetheart. I mean, happy birthday, sweetheart. So um, anyway, uh, I don't know how I went off on this tangent. What the hell was I talking about? Sorry, I went into the 10 hand, 10. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Right. So mnemonics are based on things in the natural world that we already know and understand. 10 fingers means that it's easy to remember things in tens because you can just do this. Right. Sevens are easy to remember because seven days of the week. So you can just do it. I and mean, everybody has internalized a week cycle by the time they're very pretty young. COVID screwed that up. <laughs> COVID, it was like, for two years, as Judy said earlier, two years, I'm like, is it Wednesday? Is it Shabbat? Am I supposed to be at work today? Um, threes and fours are probably easy to remember because they're, because they're small. Okay. Michelle, did you want to chime in? No. Okay. All right, so here's our, our last text of the morning. And it's a short one but with a lot of commentary. All right. Asara nisayo, uh, sorry, nisyonot, uh, nisayon is a trial or a test. Um, the opening line of the Akeda, the Akedat Yitzchak, the, the binding of Isaac's story, begins with, Vayehi achar hadvarim ha'ela, and so it came to pass after these things, the uh, nisa Arunayat Avraham. That God tested Abraham or that God put Abraham to the test. So this idea that Abraham endured tests or trials is biblical. It's not only a rabbinic notion, but the rabbis build it out. Okay. With ten trials was Abraham our father, may he rest in peace, tried and he withstood them all. To make known how great was the love of Abraham, our father, peace be upon him. I would say the love for Avraham, not the love that he uh, gave or demonstrated, but the love that God had for him. So first of all, there's a deep theological conundrum in this text. Let's just take it on face value that there are 10 trials. Um, I will tell you what they are, since I'm sure you're curious. You're like, wait a minute, I get the 10 utterances, we did that, of creation. And I took Blake on faith that there were 10 generations between Adam and Noah and another 10 between Noah and Abraham because we don't want to be reading Genesis 5 and Genesis 11 with all the genealogical lists. Let's just take it on faith. But what are the 10 trials of Abraham? We'll get to that. But I want to get to the, to the bigger point, which is each one of these 10 is packaged as a lesson, right? God did X in... A multi, in tens, in order that, in order to demonstrate, and it's always to demonstrate something about God, or the way the world works, or the way God works in the world, or the way human beings work in relationship with God and the world. God created the world with ten utterances in order to show how 
the righteous will be punished for destroying the world and the and the sorry the wicked will be punished for destroying the world and the righteous are rewarded for maintaining or upholding the world god provided 10 generations between adam and noah and another 10 between noah and abraham in order to demonstrate how long suffering god is and now here god put abraham through 10 trials or abraham endured 10 trials it's written in the passive form in order to demonstrate how much God loved Abraham. So what is challenging for you about the premise before we get into the details? The premise is that God tested Abraham 10 times in order to demonstrate how much God loved him. Audrey, take it away and just unmute yourself. I um, have a problem with that because I think that if God tested Abraham, then it's showing Abraham's love or connection to God as opposed to God favoring Abraham. Maybe both are true. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe both are true, though the conventional interpretation, not mine, the traditional interpretation is that the trials themselves were the proof text for God's <clears throat> love. That's very disturbing, by the way. Jeff. Right. I mean, if you're a parent, that doesn't fly. Thank you. Right. <laughs> Yes, my child, I wish for you to suffer right. in these 10 ways in because order to show you how much I love you. Right. right. I'm doing this because I love you. I'm sending you to Hebrew school. Right. That is your, okay, now sometimes, sometimes even good parents do this. Mommy, why do I have to do this horrible thing? Why do I have to go to school? It's actually I'm doing, I'm sending you to school because I love you, because I want you to succeed in the world, right? So we do... Let's not exculpate ourselves entirely from the godlike component of putting our children through trials as a demonstration of love. Um, we've got a lot of comments here. The order in which I see the hands is Joe, Steve, Michelle. I forgot the word I wanted to use. It, it's for him to prove himself. Mm -hmm. God wanted to make sure he was giving the uh, the new the new generation of or the creation of the Jewish people to the right person. Yeah, right. I, God, if I am going to entrust the mission of righteousness and justice in the hands of this human being, how will I know that Abraham is up to the task? I will put him through tests that will test his moral fortitude. And Abraham, as the text here says, prevails each and every time, including the most difficult, of course, you all know the 10th trial. The last trial is the binding of Isaac. And there's even a book by, I think, John Leventhal, no, uh, Shalom Spiegel, called The Last Trial, which is a compilation and uh, a, a real wonderful book on all of the rabbinic literature surrounding the binding of Isaac. So look for Spiegel, S-P-I-E-G-E-L, The Last Trial. Um, and that's a rabbinic notion that the binding of Isaac was only the last of ten. Um, Steve Maskett, Michelle, and then Eve. I was thinking that uh, um, the testing was showing of love because what didn't happen was if, if Abraham had failed, God would still have, uh, would not necessarily have reacted the same way that did with the generation after of Noah. Very nice. Great. Michelle. So Paul, God picked Abraham before the test. <clears throat> and announced it. So to say, I'm going to do all these wonderful things, I'm going to make you the father of the of all of, you know, these numerous generations, and sands and the sea and all, you know, anyway, um, of these numbers, and then test strikes me as somewhat backwards. Don't you presume, presumably, before God approached Abraham, there was something that justified it. And of course, we've got stories that, that try to fill that in. But then to test afterwards bothers me. Now, I don't know that it's true of all of the other tests, but the final one in the Akedah is, says basically, you know, he tested and now I know that you hear me. And that always bothered me because is your goal fear um beautiful 
The only reassurance I can provide you, Michelle, is that you're not the first rabbi to be troubled by this very thing. Um, so the rabbis in a midrash, which actually is interesting, it's a midrash on a line from the book of Psalms. Psalms 11, Psalm number 11, verse 5 says, Adonai tests the righteous. And the rabbis explain there are three possible reasons why God would test Abraham after electing or selecting him for holy service. One, and each one has a, excuse me, each one has a metaphor. The first is the metaphor of the potter, okay? A potter does not examine the defective vessels. Right? If, if you're a potter and you make a bunch of like tiny little clay vessels, like you know things for storing precious oils, small, delicate things, ceramic, um, the potter knows that a delicate vessel cannot withstand even a single blow for fear that he might shatter them. So he only checks the ones that look sound. If he sees one with a crack in it, the potter says, I'm not even going to test that. I'm only going to test the one that looks Perfect. So okay, again, you don't have to like these. I'm just saying this is how the rabbis grappled with the same cognitive dissonance that you've raised up in our class today. So um, for the sound ones, God may strike them or God, the potter may strike the vessel not only once, but many times to make sure that it won't break. That's explanation one. The second one is what a flax worker does with flax. All right. What happens when you beat flax? It becomes soft and fine. It is refined through the process of beating and threshing. So metaphor number two is that God was like the flax worker. The importance of testing Abraham wasn't to see if he would break, if he was sound enough for the moral mission and the difficult work that he was summoned to do, but rather, yeah, it's QA, testing, quality assurance. In this case, it was actually to refine Abraham in the process. It's like, you're going to be the father of a multitude of nations. You're going to be my granddaddy of my vision, says God. I'm going to put you through the ringer so that you come out morally refined. The third example is very interesting. Rabbi Elazar likens Abraham to, uh, or likens God and Abraham to a farmer. Okay, so God is like a farmer that has two oxen. One is strong and one is feeble. On which one does God put the yoke? The farmer puts the yoke on the strong ox because that's the one who can actually get the work done. And so all of these are ways of saying these are possible explanations for why God would test the righteous. You may like them, you may hate them, but that's what the rabbi said about it. The nice thing is you're in a common community of cognitive dissonance. Eve Lando, you're going to get the last uh, group comment for the day, and then I'm going to wrap us up. Okay. So I, I, this is following up on Audrey's comment about um, Abraham's love of God, because in, in the Koran Pirkei Avot, it says, um, Abraham, our father, was tested with 10 trials, and he withstood all of them to make known how deep was our father Abraham's love of ah. God. Okay. And at the at the end of the commentary on 10 trials, the very last sentence, rather these trials were to demonstrate Abraham's faithfulness as an inspiration to future generations. So I think it All right, up. so at least Jonathan Sachs and Mark Angel think that it's that way and not the way I parsed it. I love that. Okay. I I'll go so far as to say I think there's there's a case to be made in both directions. Lovely though. Thank you. Thank you for reading uh, more deeply than I did today. Joe, do you want to jump in? Jonathan, you're on mute. I have everybody on mute. Uh, was I unmuted? 
You were on mute the entire time you were speaking, Joe. Oh, I'm sorry. I can make a real short. In comparative religion, are there any other uh, things that agree with the idea of sustaining the world about people being wicked or, or, or uh, righteous? Because I believe when, when we divided the, the world into languages and nationalities and ethnicities and so on, it made people fight against each other. And I think now there are more wicked people than righteous people. Because the world, the, the planet is going, is going, uh, is just disappearing. And I'm, you know, disappearing. Rabbi, you're muted. Equal opportunity here. Um, just because there are a lot of people who are religious does not mean the world is getting better. And I do not know. The answer is, Joe, I really don't know. Um, I, do, I do, however, celebrate the fact that the moral responsibility of the Jew and the Jewish community is, I think, if not unique, then certainly distinctive in uh, distinguishing Judaism from among other world traditions. The, the emphasis that Judaism places on personal and collective moral responsibility, as we've seen today, is a prominent feature of Judaism, perhaps in a way that is sui generis. Um, what I'm going to do is just read the trials of Abraham, and then we'll end. The 10 trials can be counted in different ways. So again, this is a bit arbitrary. Twice when ordered to move, so lech lecha, go forth from your native land, twice in connection with his two sons, Ishmael and Isaac, twice in connection with his two wives, Hagar and Sarah, once on occasion with his, so that's six, once on occasion with his war with the four kings against the five, once at the first covenant he makes with God, known as Brit Betarim, the covenant of the pieces. We don't have to do that today. That's seven. I'm sorry, that's eight. Once, uh, in his homeland of Ur, of the Chaldees, where he was, according to Midrash, thrown into a fire by King Nimrod. That's only in Midrash. That's nine. And once when he was asked to circumcise. Um, that's one way of counting them. But the point is that the rabbis are playing a little bit fast and loose with the mnemonic here. They kind of pick and choose to find 10 as opposed to counting 10. Um, and that's because, again, 10 is already the mnemonic, and they need to mold the stories about Abraham to fit the mnemonic and not the other way around. Um, so on this note, we conclude for today. Um, I do hope that either in person or remotely, you will join us tomorrow night for our Chai Society Shabbat. It's going to be a lovely service. We are honoring two incoming classes, the class of 03 and the class of 04 who have affiliated with WRT for 18 years and more, together with all the others in our community who are members of longest standing. And it's always a special night to honor the, the real backbone of our community. So I, I hope I'll see you there, um, but I'll wish you a wonderful day and an early Shabbat Shalom and uh, please take good care. Bye-bye.